there are several things that are good things in and of themselves. But if we take a good thing and then use it to distract us from doing the first of the work we need to do, then that good thing has become a bad thing because of how we used it. So it's important to understand that even ministerial work or just um, productivity as a whole can actually be the thing that's holding you back. What's up, everyone? Lisa Fields here, and I'm so excited about our new curriculum, Courageous Conversations. You heard about our popular conference, Courageous Conversations, where we invite the leading pastors, thought leaders, and scholars from conservative and progressive backgrounds for conversations. But we not only want to have those conversations on stage at the conference, but we want you to have them in your everyday life. So we developed a curriculum for you to do just that. Courageous Conversations curriculum, the tools you need for the conversations and culture. You can get that today on Amazon or on our website at Jew3project.org. Well, thank you for watching the Jew3 Project podcast. As always, I'm your host, Lisa Fields, the founder of the Jew3 Project. And today I'm joined by my friend, uh, Malik Blade, soon to be Dr. Malik Blade. Uh, Malik has been on the podcast a number of times, so he's no stranger to the Jew3 Project. He's also moderated panels at Courageous Conversations around mental health. Um, so welcome, Malik. Thank you for having me again, Lisa. I appreciate the opportunity. Taking a break from dissertation writing, but I'm going to get back to it right after we finish. <laughs> well, thank you for, for joining us, from taking a little break uh, and, and taking a break from that rigorous uh, process of writing your dissertation. Uh, for those who don't know who you are, just tell our audience a little bit about yourself. Yes, absolutely. So my name is Malik Blade, originally from Washington, D.C. Uh, relevance in terms of for our topic today, uh, I'm completing a doctorate in counseling as well as uh, being the CEO of the Whole Brother Mission, which is a nonprofit with a network of over 3,000 mental health professionals uh, connecting black men with therapists and psychologists and counselors nationwide. So basically uh, all 50 states in Washington, DC, uh, we have an emphasis on black men, but we welcome all. And our goal is just uh, uh, helping men grow in the areas of the head, heart and hands, head being mental health, heart being emotional maturity, and hands being professional advancement. So day to day, I manage a large network of therapists and I'm looking at additional ways to offer free and low cost services to men in need. Awesome, that is super, super relevant to our conversation today. Um, what we wanna talk about today is really kind of just the state of people's mental health post pandemic. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I know a lot of people that are struggling right now with depression. Um, just talked to somebody the other day. I was like, hey, are you OK? They were just like, you know, I'm just existing. Um, I, I don't know what's going on. I'm depressed. You know, all of that. And that's not just a random occurrence. Literally, I'm talking to people every day and they're like that. And I'm talking about high achieving people. I'm talking about people who achieved all their goals and making the money they want to make, got the degrees they want to have. Um, you know, some have family, some don't. And they're like almost walking zombies. They're just existing um, some of them are people of faith, some of them are not. And so really want to talk about that because I think a lot of people that are listening, listen to the Jew3 Project that are part of um, millennials, Gen Z, even uh, Gen Y and maybe baby boomers, but particularly that millennial age and um, Gen Z are really struggling to to live the abundant life that I believe that God calls us to live. Um, and they're really wrestling just with even wanting to be on this earth. Um, so I thought Malik would be a good person to talk about this. Malik, have you seen this trend um, as far as people trying to navigate this space in this season? Yeah, I definitely have. And I just think to myself, or I wonder, is it by virtue of my work? Or has there actually been a spike in terms of people dealing with depression and other forms of mental illness? And I actually, I feel as though even if I wasn't dealing in terms of the work at the whole other mission, I think 
there has just been a spike in general, though, not just by virtue yeah. of the work. But I, in my personal life, have observed that as well, that more people are um, finding or recognizing that they are dealing with some level of discontentment with their life circumstances, self-diagnosing depression, themselves with depression and other things, anxiety. Um, and some of that is trendy, I would say. But I do think some of that is legitimate. And just thinking about uh, post-pandemic, I, I, when I look back, I wonder if that downtime that we received uh, in terms of isolation and um, quarantine, I wonder if that downtime really caused people to wrestle with certain things and forced them mm-hmm. to see and face certain things that they were allowed to avoid due to keeping busy. Uh, you mentioned earlier that certain people that you're referring to seem successful and would be happy. But I think that's the trick that comes with depression is the assumption that if someone's high functioning, that they couldn't possibly be sad or depressed or experiencing these low moods. So in all actuality, uh, some of the ways that some people cope with depression is to just try to keep busy or to not focus on it. And what the pandemic did is it took that out away from us and it forced us to face some things. So I, I imagine what we're seeing now is the aftermath of people being forced to deal with themselves. Yes. Yeah. And and you mentioned that high functioning depression, because I think as as you articulated, people think if a person is achieving a lot, they can possibly be sad because right. sadness makes you go into this attitude where you don't do anything. You just mm-hmm. kind of sulk. And for some people, that is a reality for their depression. But a lot of people who are successful can be operating in that high functioning depression space. When we talk about depression, can you define that for our audience? Because you you mentioned it being trendy. And I noticed that a lot of people have self-diagnosed themselves. I remember mm-hmm. a WebMD. It was I mean, it's still popular, but when people would have a cough or something, they would go down this <laughs> rabbit trail on WebMD and right. say, man, I, I don't know if I got cancer. I don't know if I got this or that because they didn't go to a professional. They self-diagnosed using the Internet. And I see similar right. things happening with people having sad days and going to Instagram or TikTok and looking at memes from therapists or these carousels or watching videos and kind of putting the pieces of the puzzle together and says, diagnosing themselves with a mental illness. Um, how can, how should we think about definition as a, a depression as a definition? Yeah. So I'll, I'll offer three. Uh, so one, you can think of uh, first uh, feeling depressed or feeling some symptoms that can be associated with depression. That is mutually exclusive with having being diagnosed with depression. So sometimes Mm -hmm. someone can feel depressed and not have depression, quote, end quote. So uh, some of those symptoms can include, you can be looked at as a low mood and they can include things like a loss of appetite, a a lack of interest in things that you were once interested in, feeling tired, low energy and several other things. So at any point in time, the symptoms that come with major depressive disorder, an actual diagnosis, can show up in someone's life, but they may not actually be be uh, diagnosable for depression. So we all, at some point in time, may feel some of those symptoms or some of those feelings, but not actually have um, depression in terms of what the quota is for a diagnosis. Uh, the second thing I would say, or second definition I would offer is the formal one or the second second response I offer is major depressive disorder, which uh, if we look at it from a, a clinical perspective or a very technical perspective, uh, the DSM-5 currently, and 5 might not be the latest, it may be a newer one, but the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, that's what uh, psychiatrists and those in the mental health field use to diagnose people. And... Mm-hmm. Uh, you have to meet a quota to offer a certain diagnosis. So I'll spare your listeners the time. If, they, if they're if they interested enough, they can go read uh, all the specifics that come to actually diagnose someone with depression. And it's, it's kind of lengthy in terms of how it's explained in there. But if you want the information, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, 
can explain that more in depth for you. Then lastly, I'll say there's this aspect to which uh, we can simplify that definition for today. And I would just say it's a low mood. Um, It's a low mood, uh, a lack of zeal or hopefulness. Um, But think of it on a spectrum. There can be the extreme over to this end where we're dealing with that first explanation that I explained, where you may not be diagnosable for depression, but you're feeling some of the symptoms. Um, You're waking up and not really hopeful about going to work today. You don't really want to get out of bed. Mm -hmm. But then there on the other extreme, it can be um, to the point where someone's not functional and um, dealing with suicidal ideation or even having a plan to do so. So think of it in terms of that that spectrum. I'm not feeling like it today. Today I'm just out of it or um, I'm considering ending my life is another extreme uh, of that. And then there's so many people that fall somewhere in between. So it won't look the same way for everyone. And I want to clarify, as you were alluding to this earlier, there are some people that are that will meet the quota for a diagnosis for depression, but very much so you would never know. Uh, mm-hmm. They could be a high achiever, very charismatic, and even they may you may think of them as a, a bubbly extrovert, but they still very much so maybe dealing with depression. So let's not think of it as a personality type because you never know what's going on on the inside for that person. Yeah. And we think about the guy uh, that was on the Ellen show uh, that recently took his life. Twitch. Uh, yeah, Twitch. Bubbling personality, extrovert but obviously was dealing with some deep things that you would never think, you know, he's dancing online with him and his wife uh, just 24 hours before he took his life. So it's never, like you said, you have to distinguish between the personality type and what's going on internally. Um, When, as regards to what you're seeing in the mental health space, why do you think there's a growing trend of suicidal ideations or just suicide altogether? Yeah. So I actually knowing, you know, your audience, I want to anchor this and talk about pastors first. Um, And that I say that specifically because we've seen certain high profile pastors. um, I think of uh, a very few over the past, maybe five to seven years uh, who uh, lost their life to suicide. And, um, Something to consider is the reality of the uh, suppression of it. So we were speaking earlier about people that are high functioning. And again, with this being the Jew 3 Project and thinking of ministry and church, I think of pastors who have pressure to present well, uh, to be the leader, to seem as if everything is okay. So oftentimes, uh, if we already talk about the stigma around mental health, We talk about certain norms around masculinity that might not allow men to feel free to express that they're dealing with difficulty or they're overwhelmed. And then you add the added element of high expectations of a pastor to be there and pour out for everyone else. And sometimes they don't practice self-care, so they're not being poured into. So if you mix all those elements together, it does create a, um, a valid basis for why suicide has happened frequently among some pastors or at least the ideation. Um, so part of the issue, I think, is amongst leaders for one, but even people that aren't leaders, I can speak more so for men, that there isn't this normalization of transparency and vulnerability about what you're going through. And I think that goes back to people not feeling as though they have space, safe spaces to do so. So a pastor may lead and counsel many people, but not really feel like they can turn to anyone about what they're going through or what they're experiencing. In the same way, there is some stigma for men, too, to to say I'm good even when I'm not good. So men may deal with that as well. I'm not saying that women don't, but I can allude to those first two. It's just that it hasn't been normalized for us uh, to, to vent, to air grievances and to talk about some of the things that are hurting us. And also, uh, some might describe it as toxic positivity. Uh, in Christianity, the expectation is for many of us is, is to always be happy and jovial and talk about the goodness of the Lord. And that might not leave room for people to say that they're dealing with depression. They're not feeling hopeful. They're dealing with grief or they may even be dealing with suicidal ideation. That toxic positivity doesn't leave room to bring those things to the table because it might be seen as less spiritual. 
So then mm-hmm. again, if you're a pastor, there's like, oh, I can't say, I can't say, I can't say. So I do think some of those societal norms, um, social norms, church norms are what hinder, uh, make push people to that level because they don't have space to, to let some of it out. And not to say that your friends can um, can be your counselor or your doctor, but I do think there's a strong benefit that can come from community and having spaces to just air out what is going on on the inside. Not that your friend or your spouse can be your therapist, but there's a benefit to having community. And I would argue that many people do go to therapy just because that is their attempt to try to build community for themselves that they don't have. So at least then they have someone to speak to consistently. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A lot of people go to therapy to, to, for lack of a better word, pay for a friend. Right. Uh, um, because they want somebody that's devoted to listening to them. Uh, and I mean, I've been harping on com- the por- importance of community in the last few episodes, uh, even as we're doing our series of uh, the the reliability of the Bible, because you need community even to understand God um, and mm-hmm. to understand his word. And Absolutely. so you're going to need community to be mentally healthy. And then one of the challenges for people leaning into community is because they've been hurt by people. And so they don't want to go. They don't, they feel like when we overcorrect, we go to the opposite extreme sometimes. And it's like, well, I'm not going to talk to people because people hurt me. But what you're communicating is really, you can't get to the, to the other side of depression without, opening up to people. Absolutely. And that is, some would say the lie that depression tells people is that you have to do it alone. And I've often heard people that were dealing with depression say they didn't want to be a burden to other people. So Mm -hmm. it's so much, I would even argue sometimes, not saying it 100% is, but at times some of the issues related to depression are spiritual as well, but not always. Uh, but sometimes it can relate to the spiritual as well. And there is a level of oppression uh, that is trying to get you to a point of separation from community, lack of hope, doubt in God, and even self-deprecation. And unfortunately, there are times where it can get so severe that relating to people that are dealing with depression can end up feeling as though they're, they're, they're pulling you into a dark hole that they're in, uh, depending on how they, they present that. So that's kind of the, the lie in it, though, is that uh, people aren't welcome, uh, welcoming you. People won't understand and that you can't share, that you have to isolate yourself. And going back to our original reference to the pandemic, it seemed as if, though, um, that social isolation that we were forced to do, some were already doing that before um, the pandemic. Some had already isolated themselves uh, from from loved ones and lost interest in things they were once interested in. And that's a very common thing that comes up. But unfortunately, that tends to feed it, feed it more. Um, The the dicey topic, though, is there are some uh, who are dealing with depression who would articulate that I'm grateful for the friends that understand the periods when I ghost and welcome me back without forcing me to explain myself. Um, and I, I get it. I get that some of those moments can feel very dark and there's a lot of pressure to, uh, to navigate those feelings and then deal with relationship. But on the other side of that, this the difficulty with depression is it's not just what that individual was experiencing, but it's also ends up affecting those that are in community with that person as well. So when we talk about the idea of ghosting and disappearing without communication and then just reappearing, uh, while some may not be prepared to to explain what happened, it would be ideal if we could normalize the conversation around depression to where um, people understood what those moments are like when someone may disconnect or a ghost or isolate. But then also having accountability on both sides that we can move to a point where we're not saying that um, it's OK to be damaging to those that you're in a relationship with. So it's a very nuanced, complex conversation. But depression ends up being affecting the community as well, not just the individual. Yeah, that's so helpful. Now, one thing I've seen a trend in as it relates to depression and mental illness in high achievers is this concept of like 
and these are my own words, you can never out succeed um, unprocessed trauma. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes people think if I'm just more successful, if I get a family, if I get children, if I get wealth, that will fix all the trauma that happened in my past, in my childhood. I could just achieve it away. However, mm -hmm. we see that the the trauma, the unprocessed trauma eventually catches up to you. So you can never outrun it. It's that it becomes an ever present reality. Right. Um, can you speak into a little bit more into that? Because I think that when I think about high achievers and the people who have accomplished a lot and set got these grand positions and they're still trying to figure out why is it that I got everything I want and achieved everything I want and prove the people wrong that doubted me um, that I still find myself in this place where I'm unhappy. I'm just existing. I can't I can't seem to just get it together. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, you know, Jesus and therapy uh, mm -hmm. or, or counseling, if you want to call it counseling. And I hate that I have to say that because we don't have to say Jesus <laughs> and air or Jesus and water or Jesus and food. Um, it's an understood thing that there are certain things provided that help us live a quality of life. And obviously food and water are necessities, but I, you know, I would say for some therapies a necessity too, and a variety of other things, um, community, um, Bible reading. Um, yeah, for some reason, I think in, in Christian spaces, the concern is, are you saying Jesus or the gospel isn't sufficient? Um, and again, uh, both and uh, will be beneficial for a person to grow because the reality is salvation doesn't necessarily remove all those other aspects in terms of our lived experience. So, yes, you are granted uh, your spot in eternity, but that doesn't then mean that there are, aren't things for you to navigate through along the way. And that can mm -hmm. include health issues or mental health issues. And in terms of, of navigating through that, I would say for many of us as men, um, but women as well, I would say I see this in hip hop culture as far as what rappers present. I'll see this even in pastors who want to have ministerial success. The idea is I'm going to grind or work or succeed my way through this. And the reality is those things don't heal you, though. They just distract you. So in my, my first book, um, Whole Brother, Debunking the Mr. The Break the Black Family, uh, the latter part of the book dealt with different myths that men believe uh, about masculinity. And one of them was uh, that distractions are solutions. So, so often yeah. the approach for us is to just distract ourselves with things. And for some of us, that may be success, ministerial success or secular success. And those things still don't deal with the root issue. So the reality is it ends up being even more piercing and disappointing when you achieve those things and still have discontentment. And that's because mm -hmm. those personal deeper layers still haven't been dealt with yet. So that's why I advocate for, for Jesus and therapy. Um, to navigate through some of those things to understand why you're discontent, you know, something I, and a lot of therapists use in session, is called the feeling wheel and the feeling wheel will help you get at very specific emotions about what you feel. You start in the center circle and it'll have, it'll have a general, um, general words that we use like, um, angry, but then you work your way out to outer layers of the circle and it'll get you at a very specific word. And that's a helpful tool for a lot of us because we don't, sometimes we don't sit, with how we feel or how something affected us. We just know that something is discomforting. So we distract ourselves. Let me go to church. Let me go to Bible study. Let me get some more speaking engagements. Let me make some more sales. Let me travel, vacation, work, kids. There are several things that are good things in and of themselves. But if we take a good thing and then use it to distract us from doing the personal work we need to do, then that good thing has become a bad thing because of how we used it. So it's important to understand that even ministerial work or just um, productivity as a whole can actually be the thing that's holding you back because you're not doing the personal work to assess what's going on here. And I can say from the outside looking in, um, whether folks know it or not, those things are visible to other people, too. Um, insecurity is very loud. Mm hmm. 
Yeah, no, that's that is a great point. And I think that distraction piece is so is so key. Um, one thing um, one thing I pray uh, a year ago uh, because I noticed I was so, so busy um, and I was just feeling like, man, there is a I'm not as focused as I need to be. There's some other things that I feel like that aren't as clear um, emotionally that I need to to figure out. And one prayer I pray, and I believe this is the Holy Spirit that led me to pray this prayer. God, I don't want to be distracted. I want to be whole. And I think that prayer has radically transformed my whole life. Anybody mm-hmm. that knows me closely knows that I talk about that the fact that I prayed that prayer a year ago and I've just seen God work in ways in my heart that things that I didn't even know that I still right. needed to process. Right. And so I, I encourage our listeners to, to pray that prayer, to tell the Lord, I don't want to be distracted. I want to be whole. And what I'm alluding to in that prayer is that we could, if you're, high functioning and you you know how to grind, you can get in this space where you're not necessarily cognizant. It's not cognitive that you're like working to escape things, but you do it subconsciously sometimes. And so praying that prayer helps you see like there are some things that I overlooked in my life that mm-hmm. God may want to heal that I need to slow down to give him the opportunity to do that in my life. And so, um, you know, incorporating therapy in there, um, in that journey, but also praying God, what show me what is in my heart, search my heart and show me the things in my heart that need to be healed. And I, I believe that God honors that prayer when we pray yeah. those prayers and we are willing to do the work to, to have that transformation. Mm -hmm. And I will go further to say that what I've observed is um, timing of platform ends up becoming really important. Uh, Mm -hmm. Some of this personal work is important to be done before you get to certain places in your ministry or on certain platforms. Uh, I think the assumption is, well, if I'm going to be a pastor, obviously God wants me to have a big church, right? So if something's going to lead to the growth of my church, then I should try to get that as soon as possible. And the, a lot of things that are assumed that are um, assumed to be good just because what is being done isn't necessarily sinful. But again, mm-hmm. there are so many ways I've found that we as Christians end up harming our own selves by preoccupying ourselves with ministerial things. You know, you and I have had this conversation off the record, but there are some times that God may be calling you to fall back, <laughs> you know, and mm-hmm. even though the focus may be impact, and ministry and affecting other people and the nations. But sometimes the soul that is most important in terms of this season is yours. And in that Mm -hmm. season, it might mean doing less or redirecting your attention. Uh, I remember in seminary, um, the president of the seminary, I went to Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, Dr. Aiken. uh, He said, you know, I would much rather those of you that are studying here, I'd much rather you get an A at home and then get a C in your class here. So you end up prioritizing things a little bit better. And I think that's the same way in terms of, um, you know, I'm reminded of several stories of PKs that have bitterness toward their parent who they feel put ministry ahead of them. Um, Mm -hmm. There's a, there's deeper impact beyond um, more preaching opportunities, more ministry opportunities that I do think we haven't dealt with well. And that includes that personal development, what's going on with you personally, but then what's going on with the mental and emotional health of your family. And I think we haven't prioritized these things as much because the focus has been on ministry impact, but then you see it when the pastors get the 1,500, 2,000, 3,000 member church, all these followers and book deals, but then some of those unresolved issues um, start to come out. Um, you know, I'm not going to name any names, but, you know, all these endless stories of affairs and something that was being hidden or something that was being done that was unjust or immoral. And it's not to say that pastors can't have faults 
But I do think with some of the stories we've seen in recent years, um, if the time was taken to do some personal work before just pushing for ministry platform and opportunities and gigs and speaking and book deals, then maybe some of the, the public fallings could have been avoided if attention was put to personal development, um, spiritual disciplines, and not just studying theology, but also understanding my purpose as an individual, independent of my impact, categories like that, uh, emotional intelligence, um, but even also, um, uh, more specifically for men, I would say father son relationships are also very much so a teller for who a man grows up to be, whether they consider that or not, even if they're in, um, pastoral ministry. Um, some of us, if we have a broken relationship with our dad, some of the work that we do can be what I, attributed to what I call spiteful success. So we're, if there's a broken relationship, there's an attempt to try to prove value through impact and influence. So dad neglected me, but now look what you missed out on. I'm successful. Um, and that shouldn't be the motivation for, for what we're doing to kind of spite someone. But for some of us, that is the case. So all in all, I do think slowing down and doing some of that personal work may take precedent over pushing for more platform. And it could save you from a public um, failure that then brings reproach upon the church. Mm -hmm. Let's move from the ministerial kind of outlook to the everyday parishioner for those mm -hmm. who are listening that are like, you know, I'm a person of faith. I've been praying, reading my Bible, um, but I have some traumas uh, in my life. I've achieved some things. I have a family, have kids, uh, have a job working nine to five, may have a side hustle, maybe an entrepreneur. Um, but there's some traumatic things that happened to me in my childhood, um, childhood traumas that I'm trying to navigate through. And I've prayed and I prayed and I prayed, I fasted, I can't seem to go on and then I got to engage with my family, you know, all the things they may have kids now. And they're like, man, I don't want my kids to have to suffer the way my I suffered with my parents. But I found myself doing the same things that they did to me and talking to my kids the same way my parents talked to me. And I don't know any other way. Um, what what advice would you give them? Yeah. Uh, so first, I would I want to clearly define trauma. Um, so I remember a few years ago, I believe at Courageous Conversations, Dr. Christina Edmondson clarified this on the panel discussion that we were doing. And uh, she was basically explaining how um, it's trendy now to use the word trauma as well. And sometimes trauma is understood as the bad things that happen to us. But it does get used a bit flippantly. Trauma is not mm -hmm. every bad thing that happens to you. Trauma is actually the long-term psychological and emotional effects of that bad event. So how does it show mm -hmm. up later in your life emotionally or psychologically or in your behavior? So what happens later is the trauma, how that's showing up. Um, so for example, um, if someone uh, grew up and their family moved around a lot, let's say the word military family, as a child, they moved around a lot um, and because of that, they never really got to establish deep relationships with people. 20 years later, this person's a full grown adult and now they have hesitation and a level of anxiety in forging new relationships because they have that history of having to disconnect when the family would move. Then that, that hesitancy or that anxiety later would be the trauma showing up. So I first would define that, but then I would point out, um, Something I had to accept myself as well is uh, for those of us that kind of see ourselves as high achievers or attempt to be high achievers, sometimes we set standards for ourselves that God didn't actually put on us. So if you are dealing in the mental health space or you understand those categories, sometimes you think about trauma and baggage. And because you're acutely aware of how those things negatively affect people, you may set a goal for yourself to be the perfect person that has no baggage or trauma. Um, mm -hmm. When in actuality, what God does is uh, he shows us categories like grace and patience and long suffering and shows that to us, but then expects us to show that to other people. 
So it's not that you have to go into a relationship without any problems or any issues, but it's um, dealing with your issues well as best you can and hopefully being in a relationship with people that are able to long suffer with you. So my first thing would be if someone's dealing with that, reading yourself of the self-imposed standard that you shouldn't have any issues or trauma or that the goal should be that I need to remove all these things to where there's no evidence of them. Um, that is ultimately not going to be seen on this side. But we may not say it out loud, but probably subconsciously or indirectly, we want to be or at least present perfection. Um, mm-hmm. And as, as emotionally aware, psychologically studied as one can be, that still shouldn't necessarily be the goal for the Christian. So I would say ridding yourself of a standard of perfection that means that I can't bring anything difficult into my uh, relationships. We go through different difficult circumstances. There's suffering that's a part of this life. And that can show up in a variety of ways. I think our responsibility is to do the due diligence to make sure we're dealing with people in a loving way, but also taking responsibility for our own emotional health and how we affect other people. And that includes not just focusing on spiritual disciplines, but sometimes going to therapy to process through some of our experiences. So we won't do what T.D. Jakes describes as bleeding on people that didn't cut you. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's so, so helpful. Um, I think this will probably be one of the last questions I asked, but when I think when going back to the self-diagnosing on social, you know, gas, like, um, boundaries, narcissism are words that have entered our vocabulary in ways that are helpful and sometimes ways that have been used in ways that they have not been intended to use, be mm-hmm. used. Um, and the word trigger. Um, and so everybody's trying to avoid things that trigger them which really will put you in isolation because right. an, in, an unhealed person can be triggered by any and everything. And so w- what are ways to help to, to manage those things in healthy ways, manage your triggers, and to also think through these definitions in a way that actually will be helpful for you in relationship? Because you can't label everybody that is difficult in relationship, that you're in relationship with a narcissist or all of these things. There has to be some nuance to those things. Right. Yeah. So there's there's a lot there. That's a good final question. (laughs) Um, So uh, one, again, with social media, there are things that get trendy. And who would have thought that mental health would become trendy and people are, <laughs> you know, but here we are, um, you know, people doing TikTok dances and self-diagnosing. Um, so, you know, I would say one, I want to affirm uh, the social media aspect, though. I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. It is great mm-hmm. that we now have therapists that are celebrities almost, that are influencers because of their social media platform and they're able to put out helpful content for the masses even for people that aren't in their state that can't see them, um, see that mm-hmm. therapist. Uh, so that's a positive in terms of breaking the stigma as it relates to mental health that has become a normal part of our conversation and our dialogue. Um, and I want to affirm that. But I do want to say following therapists and retweeting therapists or psychologists isn't the same as going to a therapist or a psychologist. So make mm-hmm. sure that I, I get that feeling of like, this is some really good posting this is a great tweet some good content i feel i feel better just following this person there's a lot of good content out there but it's still not catered for you so the therapy experience is supposed to be catered for you so you um can benefit from it but also get some um specific things that relate to you and i'm sure uh many of us have dealt with this where you see someone retweet or repost something that they seem to be affirming but you don't see that being manifested in their life. Uh, A therapist could be the person to kind of piece those things together to say, hey, you know, this is uh, an area that could be an area for growth for you. um, And those things can be brought to them gently. Um, 
And unfortunately, due to maybe a people pleasing or yes man culture, it is hard for us to get some of that healthy pushback um, if we're surrounded by people that are just kind of affirming us. But in that therapeutic space, that can be brought to our attention. So I would say um, starting there, not just dealing with mental health content, but talking to a mental health professional uh, would be beneficial. And there are a variety of ways to get access to people that are informed. Um, so I would say starting there and starting your own journey and processing through some of those things. Um, additionally, I'd be careful to speak on uh, certain things prematurely. So again, with this social media age, what I've noticed is everything has become content. So someone will go to four sessions and then want to talk about that journey online. That's not advisable from my perspective. I do think there's a lot to, to process through. And the Internet is also a dangerous and, quote, triggering place. So maybe uh, engaging in that process and not necessarily using it for content, but processing through some of those things um, before you jump out into uh, uh, the wilds of the Internet. In addition to that, I do think there is a misunderstanding of some of the terms. So, again, talking to a therapist, they could define some of those terms for you. But I would be careful of, of jumping out the window and trying to diagnose other people as well or, or self. Uh, I would be weary of that because, as I told you, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual is a hefty book. Um, so there are a lot of different things to pick from <laughs> that somebody could be could be dealing with that you may not be aware of. And depression just seems to be one of the more popular ones to draw to. But what someone's dealing with may not be depression. It may be something else that isn't a trendy diagnosis, but it's there. So leave that to the people, um, particularly a psychiatrist or psychiatric nurse practitioner. That would be the best person to talk to uh, in terms of a diagnosis. Um, you know, the therapist or counselor you're seeing may be able to diagnose as well, but sometimes they can't. So that's just something that to be aware of. Um, and then lastly, uh, I think community helps. So I never want to say just talk to your friends. You don't need a therapist. Talk to your friends for free. But there is something that I'm sure most therapists would affirm. There is a benefit to community. And even as Christians, we can affirm this. And so often isolation is what makes this process very difficult. So if at all possible, um, an ideal dynamic, I would suggest for people that are looking to kind of work through some of these things and not just be engaged in terms of the social aspect of it, but it actually be a part of your life. Church community. Uh, and that looks different from person to person, but church community, um, mental health community as it relates to your relationship with your therapist, but also self-care practices. That um, that trinity, uh, so to speak, I think would be a great foundation for many people. And most of us tend to be lacking one or two of those, if not all three. But if you're at a point where you're able to get all three, that's a good foundation, um, particularly the self-care practices. Um I would say, again, kind of this, this admonition has been my theme throughout for Christians. Uh, don't neglect self-care for ministry. God didn't call you to that. Um, I do think there are some wellness practices that we can implement that I could wax eloquent about for days. But um, being preoccupied with what's called the Lord's work has been spiritualized to a point where um we don't recognize it until someone has kind of a fall or, or a blow up or a meltdown or so to speak. So self-care practices include using your no. Uh, not everything needs to be accepted or said yes to, even if it's a great ministry opportunity. So using your no. Uh, mindfulness. So that can be part of your Bible reading practice, but it's also just this being aware of where your mind and heart are in is in a current moment rather than being distracted by certain uh, stimuli. So that could be music or um, being on the phone or television. So it's important to take some time to just be mindful of this is what's happening right now. This is what I'm thinking about. This is what I'm feeling. And here's how it's affecting me. You need to be self-aware. That's, the, that's the, the starting point for all of us. And being self-aware helps the therapeutic process go by a lot easier. I'll tell you right now, every therapist appreciates a self-aware client. So just starting there in terms of being aware of this is what's going on in me. And now I'm about to communicate this to you. And obviously that translates to relationships as well. So um, I'll close out with, with, the, with that trinity of uh, uh, self-care practices, 
mental health community and church community. Yeah, that's so good. And I think there's within that community, you know, if you're a ministry, a leader or just a, somebody who's gained a lot of success in life, there are tears in relationship. And so mm-hmm. one of the things that people think is because in society pushes this, if I have achieved this, the people that I grew up with can't hold me, you know. And to a degree, some people can't, you know, necessarily may not understand, you know, your job. That's why you have levels of friendships or not levels, but layers of relationship. And sometimes we've abandoned the people that we grew up with that really could be good friends in life if we do the work to maintain those relationships. They're harder to maintain because you don't have the proximity of work. You may live in a different space, but those relationships can benefit you too. And then you have work relationships. You have, if you're a hot, if you're a pastor, you might want some relationships of other executives in other fields. You don't necessarily have to have all your close friends be pastors. You want to diversify your relationships to have tiers, well, tiers, layers of relationship. Um that can see different things in you and that could cause you to grow in different areas. You don't have to, some, sometimes our relationships become so kind of, um, what's the word I want to use? We, we have the same type of people, but I've mm-hmm. benefited from having different kinds of people in my life. Some that are close to God and some that are far from him. Um, and that's okay because it helps you to grow and develop. Now I'm not saying to go get, people that just are far from God and cause you to, to drift. But I think um, having just layers of relationships just helps you holistically. Your therapist is only seeing you at the most one hour a week. Mm -hmm. That's not enough to communicate all that's in you. That's going to take a long time. If you just have one person that you're communicating with one time a week about the, the stuff that's going on inside of you. But if you have a therapist that's seeing you one time a week and you have layers of relationships, it helps speed the process along a little bit. Absolutely. So it's supplemental. Supplemental. Yeah. And I would affirm as well, there's a benefit to, you know, again, in seminary, um, what was encouraged was to read widely. And I would mm-hmm. say today the goal, um, the express goal is to converse widely as well. Um, be informed about different points of views rather than, and I, I think I can say this candidly, you know, sometimes I get it. Many of us maybe come to Christ and then our only community is the people that go to church with us. And then we can get immersed in church culture. And while that has its place, sometimes that can also be um, the death of critical thought because we're just surrounded by people that agree with us now and we're in an echo chamber. So if you could, make the extra effort to converse widely as well so that you're informed on a variety of topics. I can say now being in the mental health field and dealing with counselors of all different stripes, many of them are not Christians. um, I deal with all kinds of different worldviews and viewpoints. And I would say it stretched me and benefit me so that I can engage with certain topics critically and not just um, in a scripted way, give the stereotypical Christian response, I think you can maintain your convictions, but if you do converse widely, you can engage with topics in a more thoughtful and nuanced way as well while maintaining those convictions. But you only get that from reading reading and conversing widely. Yeah. Yeah, that's so good. Um, One thing I will say, I think that I think needs to be added to this conversation is be patient with yourself on your journey to wholeness. Mm-hmm. This isn't going to take, I mean, depending on how much you have to work through and some of many of us are, you know, older than 20, we're, we have 20 years of stuff we have to work through from childhood on up. And it's not going to get all processed in eight therapy sessions. Um, so mm-hmm. you have to give yourself time and for the process to happen. Um, and one of the ways you help the process 
alone is, like you said, the trinity of things that you you would suggest. So be patient with yourself. And if you want to help your journey along, you do that by adding other people to it outside of your therapist. Um, yes. Malik, how can what uh, how can you mention your book? How can people get your book and how can people follow you on social and how can people get your services? Yeah, everything's available on wholebrothermission.com. That's W-H-O-L-E brothermission.com. And again, we have a network of 3,000 plus mental health professionals. So our specialization is kind of focusing in on black men. Uh, but anyone who may be looking for a referral to a therapist, feel free to reach out to us on wholebrothermission.com. Click the Get Help tab and you can schedule an intake call to then be connected with someone to, to find a therapist. Um, and there are a variety of options as well. And for those that meet um, the, the necessary parameters, there are some free and low cost options as well. Um, so everything, uh, social uh, books available on wholebrothermission.com. And I'll kind of announce this here a little bit early too. Um, another book is forthcoming with Our Daily Bread Ministries, which will be a uh, men's devotional with contributions from several um, black men in different ministerial fields, but also in the mental health field as well. So by way of the whole brother mission, several black male therapists and psychologists and uh, and, uh, neuroscientists uh, as well will be writing um, several different articles as a several day devotional to black men specifically. Because I do think sometimes um, we get lost in the fray. Sometimes we're not a prioritizer. The ladies get a lot of stuff and then the guys get overlooked. So we're working on something for, for men, particularly with our Daily Bread Ministries to be forthcoming as well. Awesome. And um, most people don't know that most insurances do um, cover a lot of your therapy costs. And so Whole mm-hmm. Brother Mission will also uh you can tell them what uh, insurance you have and they'll match you with the therapist that takes your insurance. Uh, So that's also a benefit because most people don't know that they think their insurance won't cover it, but most insurance now does cover uh, therapy. So Mm -hmm. whole brother will help you in your quest to get a therapist that matches your insurance to help offset the costs. Right. And just be on the lookout for what your copay is because some people uh, come and like, all right, I got insurance. So it should be free, right? Well, not always. Call your insurance company to see what your copay is. Uh, but again, if you reach out to us and schedule that intake call, uh, we'll help you through that process as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Malik, for joining us. Remember, you can catch all our past episodes at Jude3Project.org. Um, you can listen wherever you stream your favorite podcast. You can watch on YouTube, Facebook, our curriculums. Our newest curriculum, Courageous Conversations, uh, the tools you need for the conversations and culture is on Amazon, on our website. Also, go to unspokenmovie.com to get the curriculum unspoken that goes along with the documentary unspoken. It will bless you, help you grow in your faith. We have merch, online courses, all the things. And if you want to become a monthly partner, if this uh, is blessing you, um, help us uh, f- continue to fulfill the mission by going to jewthroughproject.org org backslash donate hit that donate tab on there you have the option to give online or by mail every gift helps equip remember here at the Jew 3 project we're helping you know what you believe and why you believe it until next time grace and peace and god bless